So let me just say and give the identities for each of the four. I'm sure you're familiar with some or if not all of them. Go, starting at my left, we have Jim Stack of Investec Market Research. Then we have Louis Navalier, Blue Chip Growth, and uh, a number of letters, but Blue Chip Growth is the one that has the best five-year record at the moment. Then we have Kelly Wright of Investment Quality Trends and Douglas Gerlach of Investor Advisory Service. So the topic for today's uh, uh, panel is not really an attempt to say that the bear market has begun. These are topics that have to be chosen not just weeks, but several months in advance. And so we try to come up with topics that we think are sufficiently provocative to get you to come listen. Obviously, it's worked. But there may be that a bear market has begun. So we're going to ask each of the columnists, not columnists, each of the panelists to start off by day, today by talking about whether they think a bear market has begun. And then in any case, to talk about how you should go about picking stocks in the event that you think a bear market might be beginning either now or in the future. So I, uh, when I've done this panel before, I've either gone in uh, re straight or reverse alphabetical order. I'm just going to do it randomly this time. I'm going to start at the far end with Douglas, and we'll just go down the panel that way. So be thinking of questions that you want to ask the panel. So I I'm going to ask each one of them to keep more or less to five minutes by way of introductory remarks. That'll give us uh, 25 minutes for questions and answers and discussion. I'll have plenty of questions to ask in case you don't. But I'll be very disappointed if you don't. So please come up with lots of questions that are on your mind that you'd like to ask a panel as distinguished as the one that we have assembled here for you today. So without further ado, Douglas. Thanks, Mark. As to the question whether we have uh, started, a bear mark, uh, whether a bear market started or is about to start or will come soon, uh, we don't care. <laughs> Our approach is, is such that we invest in individual equities. We find the best stocks at the current price in the current market. We hold through bear markets. We acknowledge that bear markets on average last about 10 months. There hasn't yet been a bear market that hasn't ended, although some book writers and columnists may tell you that we're going to enter a bear market that will last forever. Maybe some of the panelists will tell you that we're the one that's coming soon will be worse than any of the others. But our approach is pretty, is pretty uh, market neutral uh, because of our focus on individual equities. I, I suspect that many of our subscribers are in the accumulation phase, and that makes, a big, uh, uh, makes a something of a difference. Uh, uh, Benjamin Graham wrote in The Intelligent Investor that bear markets are great for buying good companies at, at cheap prices. And that's what, the way that we approach bear markets as a general sale on stocks that uh, the, the correction in overall prices uh, generates opportunities to buy quality businesses at, at discount prices. Uh, and we, we have a five-year horizon, and that five-year horizon is not an arbitrary figure. It's because the economic cycles and the bull and bear market cycles uh, in a five-year period Chances are very good, if you look historically at the market and economic history of the country, that we're going to be out of the recession, that we're going to be on the way to recovery, that we're going to be out of the bear market and into the next bull market phase. Uh, so if you have that patience and that perspective to look out to the long term, uh, we think that, that for many individual investors, that's a, a prudent approach. Uh, a lot of traditional Wall Street uh, investment banks and brokerage firms don't like that approach because there are fewer commissions in it for them. Uh, and so over the years, Wall Street has taught you all sorts of techniques about moving your assets around. Uh, a lot of them generate a lot of commission activity for brokers, but don't really do a whole lot for your portfolio. So we're, pr we're pretty anti-market timing in general. Um, as to the state of the market, we acknowledge the, the P.E. ratio of the S&P 500 around 20. Um, that's skewed a little bit by the energy sector, which the average P.E. is around 30. Uh, so uh, we're finding it more difficult now to find bargain stocks, uh, stocks with the P.E. ratios that we like. So that's a, another sign that the market is... Uh, is at an elevated pace, but also the earnings of the S&P 500 are at a, at a higher level than they've ever been and are growing. And a uh, little choppy, we expect, in the next quarter, uh, but probably picking up in the second half of the year, uh, seeing companies, again, just uh, delivering modest growth. And I think that bodes well for, uh, for the state of uh, interest rate increases as well as the fundamental strength of uh, most companies, many companies in the market, the companies that we find attractive in our approach. Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mark. 
Look, at the risk of being controversial, which nobody on any panel should be, um, you know, I think we've been in a bear market since 2000, but it's an intellectual discussion for another time, <laughs> and it doesn't always have to do with price. Um, <clears throat> Like Douglas, uh, we are stock pickers. Uh, the straw that stirs our drink are dividends, dividend yields, and dividend trends. We're more worried about the market of stocks than we are the stock market. And I just, let me give you this analogy. My bride who, of 27 years who was here, she's probably out contributing to the economy even as we speak. Um, anyway, we have, we have five kids, four of which are still in home, although our oldest did just get back from college. And, and you know, we keep a calendar on our pantry door in the kitchen. And it looks like hieroglyphics and, st and you know, I mean, my God, I can't read it. My wife takes care of it. But we got, you know, kids going this way, this way, you know, all the time. So events, 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 you know, our life is structured around events. And I, I think what happens so much in investing, you know, so many investors, they start structuring the portfolio around an event. And, and I think we could almost learn something from the professional um, athletic teams. You know, we just had an NFL draft. You know, and every NFL team has uh, a group, and what they do is that they put together what they call a board. And they're looking for the best player available. You know, and they've always got this constant list. And I, I think I've, I've evolved to that position, you know. I've got this uh, in my mind where I want my portfolio, where I want my client's portfolio to be. And, um, you know, in, in, in every day in the market is a draft day. You know, and, and Mr. Market might not give you the player you want today, and that's okay. You know, if, if you don't like today's market, just wait and it'll be different tomorrow or next week or next month. But if you're patient, you're going to get the players you want, meaning you're going to get this, the pieces for your portfolio that you want. And so what we look for is we look for really great, high-quality companies that have really long track records of dividend payments and dividend increases. You know, that, that they know how to attract, uh, train, and retain the next generation of management, yada, 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 yada. And so what we're doing is we're waiting for these really, really great companies in each of the areas that we're interested in to become... Uh, you know, the, to the area of value that we're looking for, the area of high yield that we're looking for. And so, in a lot of times, we're looking for stocks that have been through their own bear market. It doesn't matter what's going on in the global economy, in the global market. We, we, we want to find stocks that are really great companies that have been in their own bear market. That, uh, or they've increased their dividends so much, they just represent just truly ridiculous value on a historical basis. So instead of going from event to event to event to event, which would put CNBC out of business, but I, I'm not going to get emotionally involved in that. Uh, it would put a lot of other people out of business, but once again, I don't care. Uh, instead of thinking about, you know, this event or that event, you know, every day is an opportunity to make your, make your team better. Every day is draft day, okay? And, and I think uh, we would all be better off if we thought of about our portfolios like that. You would always want to read Market Watch columnists, though. I do want to say that, of course. With the exception of Market Watch columnists, yes. <laughs> yeah. <that's true>. Anyway, <laughs> Louis. No, we're not in a bear market, but uh, it is a, a narrowing market. So let me give you the good news first. Um, on January 12th, uh, from a Market Watch article, um, th they discussed how the uh, S&P 500 dividend yield uh, rose above the 10-year uh, Treasury yield. And that's only happened three times in the last uh, 50 years, and on average, the market goes up 31.5% in the next 12 months. So we're still in the middle of that. Uh, a lot of people buy stocks for yield. Uh, the S&P yields almost 2%. That's obviously tax advantage, tax at a max rate of 23.8, which is better than interest, tax at a max rate of 43.4. So that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is earnings went poof and disappeared for the S&P. Uh, and that's because we had this incredible dollar rally since last June. The dollar's given some of those gains back, but still up dramatically. And because half the S&P sales originate from outside of America, uh, the big multinationals have been getting paid in, in a depreciating currencies, which is why the sales of multinationals are pretty bad shape, and sales for the S&P are basically zero. And earnings are supposed to be zero, but thanks to buybacks, uh, it looks like they'll be up uh, 2 to 3 percent. But uh, that's pretty anemic. Now, um, 
the market has been melting up with no volume, which is kind of odd, but there, there's something going on I should let you know about. The market returned $904 billion to you last year via stock buybacks and dividends. And that's almost 5% of the outstanding market cap. And uh, I know, unlike in our blue chip growth letter, our average stock retires 4.2% of its float a year. So um, uh, what happens is when it gets kind of quiet and choppy, uh, the, the, a lot of stocks just firm up because the dividend yield writes their ship and uh, the buybacks are relentless. So, um, so that's all the good news. So let's get to the, uh, uh, the, what's really going on. The market has gotten more narrow. As any market goes higher, it gets more narrow. It's just like a race. And in January, the top 22% of the stocks are in database look pretty good. The, um, the going into April it was only top 14%. And uh, I have to tell you that both the economists and the analysts were way too optimistic. And um, we now know that our economy didn't grow in the first quarter. In fact, they'll revise GDP down. We had a horrific uh, March trade number. Uh, some of it could have been due to the West Coast port strike. Uh, a lot of it could be the strong dollar uh, suppressing the value of our exports and hurting exports. But uh, that March trade number was the worst in six, six years. And uh, so it's going to take a big chunk out of GDP growth. You saw today that retail sales are anemic. Um, on Friday when they announced the payroll report, they were all excited. The number was good. They forgot to tell you that they've revised it down three months in a row, January, February, March. And March was pathetic. And uh, the reason they keep revising the payroll, uh, payrolls down is a lot of the jobs in America are temp. So when some ambitious person gets two temp jobs, they get counted twice. And by the way, that's not me saying it's the Fed in their FOMC minutes, which is why they, re they removed their unemployment target. And so we've had double counting the job market. They fixed the numbers. And, um, but uh, the broader household survey is actually contracted in March and didn't grow as much in April as the payroll survey. So there seems to be a problem. So we're in this Goldilocks environment where the Fed will not be raising rates. And um, I like to say they're not going to raise rates in my lifetime. <laughs> and then people want to know how long I'm going to live. And so I'm planning to live to July because my oldest daughter's getting married. But uh, I don't think they'll be raising rates at all this year. And that's just not me. That's the Chicago Fed president, the um, Boston Fed president, Minneapolis Fed president, uh, Mr. Dudley, the New York Fed president. He's, they're not going to raise rates. The, the Fed takes the unemployment mandate very seriously. Janet Yellen's a labor economist. And then, of course, there's no inflation. And, and then the, there's market rates around the world uh, did decline. I know there's been a little blip here lately, but, uh, you know, as they can't fight market rates. And then next year they come under political pressure not to raise rates because you don't want to raise rates in, going in, in presidential election. And if you don't believe me, uh, just go back to when Janet Yellen was in front of Congress uh, a couple months ago, Senator Schumer was begging her not to raise rates. So um, the zero interest rate environment will fuel relentless buybacks. The tail will continue to wag the dog, which means people will buy stocks just for the dividend yield, even if the earnings and sales are anemic. But uh, I, on the other hand, will only buy ones with good sales, good earnings, and, and uh, dividend yields and buybacks on top of that. So uh, that's what we specialize in finding our blue chip growth letter. It's our flagship letter. We're very proud of it, and uh, we're very proud of our risk-adjusted performance, too. We've tried to keep it as steady as possible. Thank you, Louis. Jim. We, we personally do care if there is a bear market on the horizon. They can be extraordinarily damaging to someone in retirement with a six- or seven-figure portfolio. You, know, you really can't go through a bear market like we went through in 2008 and 2009, lose 58% of your portfolio and say, hold on, you know, we always, the market always comes back. Um, our focus is on managing risk. That is not market timing. We've never thought of ourselves as market timers. Our turnover in our managed accounts is only 23%. That's about one third of what it is in the average mutual fund out there. So when we step into positions, they are long-term oriented holdings. I do think it's late in the bull market. This is already the third longest bull market in Wall Street history. For it to go into 2016, it will have to become the second longest bull 
bull market in Wall Street history, second only to the dec decade of the 1990s. Macroeconomically speaking, there's a lot of evidence that there is not a recession on the near-term horizon. The LEI, leading economic indicators, has been hitting new highs 14 consecutive months. Typically, the lead time between a peak in that LEI and the start of a recession is nine months or longer. So, so economically speaking, this economy is on stable footing. Technically speaking, I would agree with, with Louis, there, there are some clouds forming overhead. We are seeing some divergences, a narrowing in, in the market. We're seeing it in, for example, the transports. Dow Jones transportation average actually hit its high last December. It has not hit a new high this year in spite of the favorable energy prices. We're also seeing a flat line in what we call our bellwether index. Those are the leading stocks in those leading sectors that tend to peak ahead of the stock market at major market peaks. Our bellwether index has flatlined for the last four and a half months. To us, that's not good news. Um, those are some of the reasons why we have started increasing our defenses. In addition, I think there's a very um, bullish psychology out there, even excesses in that psychology. Investors' intelligence tracks the percentage of bullish and bearish advisors. Today, it, uh, it shows there are only about 13.5% bearish advisors out there. That's the lowest level in 28 years. That doesn't make me comfortable. I don't like it when everyone is lined up on one side of the fence. At the same time, margin debt has gone astronomical. There's a lot of speculation. There's a lot of leverage out there. Margin debt is at record levels. Even if you normalize it as a percentage of GDP, margin debt is back up to where it was at the last market peak and at the 2000 market peak. Now, that's not a problem as long as that margin debt is high and continues going higher. The problem is it looks like it's peaking. If it's peaking and starts dropping, then so that leverage is going to start unwinding. And, and right now, that means our strategy is to err on the side of caution. We're in the seventh year of this bull market. We're not going to have the same strategy we had in the first half of this bull market. We've increased our cash allocation incrementally. Uh, we are up to 24 percent cash. That is our highest cash position since the start of this bull market back in 2009, in the first couple of months. That still means we're 76 percent invested, but that 76 percent, we're also shifting toward more defensive sectors. You know, different sectors outperform differently depending on whether you're in the early stages of an economic cycle and bull market versus the latter stages. And there are certain sectors that, that hold up better. We've done a lot of studies on the last year, the last third of a bull market. There are certain sectors that hold up much better or perform better in that last third of the bull market. And we're shifting our, that 76 percent invested over gradually toward those more defensive sectors because no one knows exactly where this bull market is going to peak. I do believe once the peak is in place, we will see confirming signals from a lot of those technical tools like the AD line, like our bellwether index, and, and, and I think you will see a tightening from the Fed on the horizon. I, I hope it's still in my lifetime, that, that, <laughs> or, if, or, or unless we end up in a deflationary debacle. But the main thing out there, and I think something all the panelists will agree with, is stick with value. You know, don't go play the momentum game in a late stage bull market, because if you do, you're going to get burned. There are value selections out there, but it's a time in which you have to become increasingly selective to find that value. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> so have you got questions in mind? If not, I have plenty to ask. But let's see if there's some questions you'd like to ask our panelists. Yes. I would like to ask you your opinions on the IMF uh, meeting on October 20th and what the making, making the long part of the uh, currency, reserve currency would affect stocks, bonds, and the U.S. economy. I'm going to repeat the question. By the way, we're being webcast, so they need to hear the question. So if I understand it correct, the question is uh, the comment on the IMF meeting and the, uh, the recommendation to make the yuan part of the basket of currencies and what impact that will have. Did I get the question right? Yes. Good. Any yeah, comments? Yeah, my, I can take this question. Um, anytime there's a panic in the world, the currencies that do the best are the most liquid. So that is the U.S. dollar the euro, the Japanese yen, and the, and the British pound. 
Uh, the Chinese yuan has emerged as a very stable currency because they have higher rates than the, the rest of the world. Uh, the, um, and, they, and that currency is widely respected. So I would not be surprised if they add it. It would just give the world extra liquidity. Um, but outside of these liquidity events, then the currencies can weaken based on the quantitative easing and things like that. So the reason the euro is weak and the Japanese yen is, is weak is because of all the quantitative easing they're still doing, even though we've turned off our pump and Britain's turned off their pump. Uh, China is now embarking on all kinds of stimulus measures at this moment. Uh, they cut rates on, on the weekend, you know, on Sunday. And um, so, uh, you know, if they pump a little bit too much, they might, they might be frowned upon. But uh, they're, they're a widely respected currency. Any other comments? Yes, yeah, Jim. Yeah. If you look at it globally from a historical perspective, if you step back to 1989, the Nikkei was at 40,000. That's twice the level it is today, 25 years later. And yet a Gallup poll in 1989 of U.S. adults found that the majority thought that Japan had taken over as the global economic leader. And, and you're seeing a lot of the same psychology or fears today about China. China's taking over. It's going to be the global economic leader. Who knows when you look 20, 30, 50 years down the road. But at the same time, if they bring the yuan in as part of the global currency basket, I, I don't think that's a bad thing. But at the same time, so much of the Chinese economy and the statistics they compile and what they release is closed. They're closed doors. It's not trusted. I, I think that, that the U.S. dollar is going to remain the global reserve choice of you know, the reserve currency for the world for at least for the next 10, 15, perhaps even 20 years or longer. And, and we'll have to reassess that when we get 10 years down the road. So it doesn't worry me that the, that the IMF would, would look at bringing the yuan in. Douglas, Kelly, anything? Other questions? Way in the back. Yes, you mentioned the fact that your shifting sectors is played in the market. Can you tell us what sector is your favorite and perhaps you could ask it as well? Just to repeat for the webcast, the question is what sectors would be uh, chosen now as we get into a more defensive or narrow narrowing of this bull market? It's for Jim and then any of the other the panelists. Yeah, what we did, we have a good friend, Sam Stofall, inside S&P, so we share a lot of re, uh, results and studies and data. At the same time, we have access to sector data going back to the 1980 and some of it even going back to 1972. So what we asked ourselves is, which sectors held up best or performed best in the last year of a bull market or in the last third of a bull market? And those two actually lined up very well. So I'll give you the sectors for the last third of a bull market. The sectors that actually perform the best, and we look both in total return and what you call batting average, how often they outperformed the S&P, the sectors that moved to the top of the list were, the, were energy, which tends to be one of the best late stage bull market sectors, uh, technology, industrials, and healthcare. Now, not so surprisingly, those sectors that tend to move to the bottom of the list in terms of performance in the last third of a bull market are those that are the strongest in the first part of the bull market. The ones that are at the bottom that we are reducing our allocation in at the very bottom are the financials. And one of the reasons is because they are interest rate sensitive. You also have utilities, again, that interest rate sensitivity. And you also have consumer discretionary third from the bottom. And part of the reason is because Consumer discretionary typically is one of the strongest performing sectors in the first third half or, or majority of the bull market. So it's, it's not surprising that it tends to get exhausted as the, as the bull market matures. Well, first of all, there's uh, 10 S&P industry sectors. There will soon be 11. They're adding a REIT uh, sector, and I suspect it's going to be very popular because it's going to have a big, fat, juicy dividend yield. And people will just go buy that ETF to get the dividend yield. I think it will be one of the most successful ETF launches ever. But with that said, uh, I will admit of all the, t the current 10 sectors in the S&P, they, they seem to have an earnings issue. But with that said, uh, tech is clearly an oasis, as is uh, health care, as is consumer staples and consumer durables. Uh, we at our management company do ETF management. Um, 
those are the sectors that are definitely stand out the most. I personally, though, uh, would rather pick the best stocks in those sectors. And um, it's just because the market's getting too narrow right now. But um, I know how to diversify risk, so uh, I think I can pick stocks and diversify risk, and it'll be even safer and better performing than the sectors at this time. Well, we, we're bottom-up stock pickers. Um, like I said earlier, we're more interested in the market of stocks than the stock market. So I look at what Mr. Market has handed me in terms of value and based on our metrics of dividend yield, et cetera. And it just so happens that right now I have great opportunities in the energy sector. Uh, I have some, some stuff that I like in the tech sector. Uh, I have some stuff that I absolutely love in the industrial sector. And then there's, there's some of these that I, I wouldn't get near. Um, I think Jim mentioned them, uh, or maybe Louis. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of, of financials or utilities at all, but uh, I love energy tech and industrials right now. You? Well, again, we're, we're bottom-up stock pickers as well, so we don't look at the, uh, 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 at, the, at the sector so specifically or industry groups. Um, uh, our growth bias uh, leads us away from utilities uh, and from energy. Uh, we just don't see the consistent growth from those sectors, so we tend to avoid them. But uh, we do have a lot of coverage of industrials. We like boring companies that just churning out returns year after year, earning, uh, increasing their earnings, increasing their sales. Uh, and we also have skew towards smaller and mid-sized companies. So we don't have as many brand name stocks, big company stocks in our portfolio. Um, and again, we're not we're not looking for particular sector rotation. Some of the lowest, but we do we do have you know track uh, uh, lower PE stocks, and I think that those are a little defensive because in, if we do have a correction, they're going to be affected less than sort of the high flying stocks. But we 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 just really eschew the high PE companies. We just can't can't stomach the uh, volatility of many of those high PE stocks, and, we, and are looking towards the lower PE companies. We can. If we're ready to name names, just yes, let me know. Yes, please. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I mean, some of our picks are probably a little more contrarian, uh, but building on some of the trends, uh, you know, the strong dollar has certainly impacted the larger, larger companies that we own, and the smaller companies are primarily more domestic, and they're not as affected by uh, the currency issues. So some of the smaller <coughs> companies that we track are, um, uh, are uh, a little more attractive right now. Uh, on the... Uh, on the theme of low PE stocks uh, that have a decent long-term uh, total return potential from, uh, from our perspective, Cummins, the, en energy, uh, the uh, power generator engine company, CMI uh, is the ticker, Precision Cast Parts, PCP, so, and uh, Emerson, EMR, are, uh, are right now on our list of, uh, when ranked by low P.E. ratio, uh, they're pretty low relative to where they've been in the past and seem to have sort of an outsized potential. Uh, and those are in the industrial sector, so uh, that's, uh, I think those would be an interesting place to be looking at companies right now. Yeah, why don't I ask for stocks from each one of the panelists? This is a, co this is a panel about stock picking, after all. Okay, you just want to reverse? Yes. Okay, we'll just reverse. All right, real quick, I mean, I, I, I've got a, a huge list in the energy sector, but uh, I'm just going to stick with uh, Exxon, Chevron, and Schlumberger. Um, the, on a dividend yield basis, um, those are all excellent values. Um, <clears throat> we we uh, started buying IBM a little bit while ago because uh, IBM's dividend yield got to a point where it uh, showed value. It still does. Um, I didn't say anything about consumer discretionary, but Philip Morris International is another company. Um, it's a hideous business, but, you know, I'm not here to be a social arbiter. Um, its dividend yield is, is uh, got it right, it's smack dab in the, in the value area that we're looking for. So that would be one. Um, then I'll leave it for there for right now. Okay, well, you have to be more domestic now, and uh, I do a lot of large cap management, and um, it's hard to find domestic large caps, but I'll give the ones I know. Um, Kroger, the, the supermarket chain, uh, Southwest Airlines, um, Lowe's, Home Depot, healthcare companies, uh, CNC, uh, Centene Corp, very, very small healthcare companies should get bought out, Anthem Health Group, and T uh, M, I believe, uh, United Health Group, UNC. 
We do like the biotechs too, they're more multinationals. Um, Gilead, uh, GILD would be one, hepatitis C pill. Uh, we've got the uh, a Biogen I bought on the pullback here. Um, missed sales and earnings, but forecasts are incredible. A lot of you may know I'm in a CNBC stock picking contest. I like activists very, very much. It's a uh, big generic pharmaceutical. They bought Allergen, which is the Botox company. Um, so um, uh, what else do we have? Uh, I think I mentioned Lowe's and Home Depot. Everybody's got to fix up their home, especially in New England. Um, uh, what else do we have? Uh, and there's some specialty retailers we like, like a Dollar Tree and things. But you do want to be more domestic. Um, and uh, that's really the key right now is to get away from that currency risk from the dollar and stay closer to home here. Jim. I'll, I'll give you four stocks, one from each of those four sectors that have migrated to the top of the performance in, in the last third of a bull market. In technology, we like Accenture, and I should emphasize that we do have these in our managed accounts for disclosure purposes. That symbol ACN, it's one of the world's leading uh, manuf uh, management consulting and outsourcing firms. It serves 89 of the Fortune Global 100 firms. It's a defensive stock. Half defensive stock. Half its revenues come from recurring subscription type uh, fees. Today you want to buy those companies that are selling the razor blades, not just the razors. Um, at the same time, its 10-year average revenue growth is 8%, earnings growth 14%. It has no debt. That's the kind of company you want to hold potentially going into you know, a downturn ahead. Nielsen, symbol NLSN, that's in the industrial. You've heard of it, uh, Nielsen Ratings. It's a leading name in the ratings industry. 70% of its sales are recurring, and um, its average client tenure is over 30 years. Uh, management expects both earnings and dividends to grow at double-digit rates over, over the long term. Uh, from the energy sector, uh, our portfolio management team uh, told me take Chevron to the table for them. Symbol CVX, 4% dividend yield. Um, they have increased at 27 consecutive times, 11% per year increase in that dividend yield over the last decade. Uh, it also has the highest profitability per barrel of any integrated out oil energy company out there in both the upstream and downstream operations. And it's expected to grow production 20% in the next three years. Um, Express Scripts, that's in the healthcare, that's symbol ESRX. It's the largest pharmacy benefit ma uh, manager in the country. Earnings per share have been growing at 24% a year for the past decade, and they're still forecast to grow between 10 and 20% in the foreseeable future. It's selling at a PE of barely over 17, which is a big discount to the, the PE ratio of its peer group, which is closer to 28. Uh, out of those four stocks, the first three pay between 2 and 4% dividend yield, which I think is, is an important takeaway in this kind of market. So by my calculations, there's only one stock that was mentioned by two of you, and that's Chevron. Is that right? So anyway, yes, sir. So the question, just to repeat, for the web is, uh, if I understand it correctly, is to bring politics into the equation that's the elephant in the room. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll be politically incorrect. Um, markets have historically rallied in the third and fourth year of a presidential election term because apparently all the candidates run around and tell us what we want to hear. Okay? And then we elect one of them and we wonder why we did that. So. They're going to be in full suck-up mode, uh, you know, <laughs> next two years. And um, I would just advise you to vote uh, f uh, for the happy person. Uh, you know, it's, <laughs> you know, the, the, the president is um, supposed to be a cheerleader for the country. And, uh, and uh, we probably all have to cheer up and be happy. And, uh, uh, you know, I met Marco Rubio uh, when I was on CNBC last time. Seemed a pretty normal guy, and um, of course he hadn't declared by then. He's probably will get a little stiffer now. But the uh, 
Uh, I see Joe Biden a lot. His brother lives down the street from me. Um, I personally think it would be good to have a funny, senile president. Uh, uh, um, but uh, in the end, uh, please, please vote for the person that inspires you and, and is, is a happy person and hopefully makes everybody else happy. Does anyone else want to touch that subject? No. I, I don't think anyone wants to go after that. And no one follows Louis. When yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, do you have any recommendations on what to do with your cash? Recommendations on what to do with cash. Boy. <laughs> ne next question. <laughs> yeah. There, there is no secret haven out there. There's no safe high yield. There are safe yields, but they're close to zero. And there are high yields, and they carry high risk, and they get a lot higher if we are in the latter third of this bull market and we go into a bear market and or a recession over the next couple of years for some, some reason. You know, cash is one of those things that, that helps you sleep at night. And, and I know that, that as a young investor, it was always burning a hole in my pocket. I've got to do something with this. I've got to. It was easier when money market funds were paying 5 6%. Or when I started this business, they were paying 14% back in 1981. Um, today, it's not comfortable holding cash, except with the recognition that profit opportunities always come around again. And it took me a, a number of years investing and, and even a few years in this business to have a full respect for that, for that recognition that if you go out and you chase yields or you try to chase that bull market, you end up regretting it because you're usually piling in too late. So, so the bottom line answer is I don't have a good answer for you for your cash other than knowing that that chances are you're going to be able to use that toward you know, at least a third off or maybe even a half off sale you know, in a not too distant future down the road. So I'm going to ask a follow up, Jim. So a client comes in with 100 percent cash in his portfolio. Are you going to invest 76 percent of it in the market right now? We have clients who um, actually come in the door and I see our portfolio team back in the corner here that we flew down with us to hold hold um, workshops. It's a tough question. You know, we could be pumping up our assets under management. Right now we're around 1.2 billion. We could easily take that up another 200 million. And if we have new clients come in the door, we tell them if the, it's not in equities today, we sit down and have a heart to heart with them. And we tell them, look, you know, what is your tolerance for equities? And no, I mean, the, the, the pat answer for our industry is bring it to us and we will take it right in. But we are actually turning money away. And that is the most ethical thing for us to do for those new clients. Now, if new clients have assets with other equity managers, that's a very easy question because we have a historical track record that is much better in managing risk. So, yeah, it, it is a tolerance for risk, and it is a, it is a very one-on-one -on -one relationship discussion with that. But the answer is no. We don't take them from zero percent. If they've sent out this entire bull, bull market, the last thing I want to do is take someone who is 100 percent in cash and take them up to a 76 percent allocation level. And that's just, just my my ethical standard in, in dealing with, with Let me ask the same clients. question of the other panelists. Well, first of all, uh, if you live in Europe or Japan, you probably know you have negative rates. So uh, a lot of that capital has been pouring into America, especially from Europe. If you lived in Russia, you might notice they were trying to buy cars, anything, because the ruble dropped 54 percent for a while. So there might have created some bubbles in the Miami housing market, the New York housing market, where I live in South Florida, there's definitely foreigners coming in, creating bubbles in property markets. Uh, they buy cars, they buy art. I mean, anything to get away from that negative yield. But what's interesting is if you bought gold last year as an American, you really didn't make money. But if you got, bought gold last year as a European, you actually made money. So. Um, so we see the metals market firming up due to all the uncertainty in the world, these negative yields. Now, yields have turned up dramatically in Europe in the last three weeks because of the Greek situation. They did make two payments to the IMF. 
they're now officially broke, but uh, the uh, you know there wasn't a default, so maybe rates will settle back down. So it's interesting to watch the capital flight flight around the world, and um, and uh, but you know I I'm not a gold bug, but I would argue that if I lived in Europe, it would, it would look a lot better than the bank count right now. Well, you know, in a in an optimum situation, you know, I want to own 25 to 30 stocks. And, you know, Louis brought up the sectors in the S&P and, you know, there's, I count nine because there's some I don't pay attention to. And so, you know, I, I want the top three or four, what I think are stocks in each of those sectors. So that's going to take me up to somewhere between 25 and 35 stocks. <clears throat> but I only want to buy them when their dividend yield is at a historically repetitive area that, uh, uh, of high yield. And if I can't get something I like or something I want at its area of what we call value, <clears throat> then I'm not going to, you know, put the cash to work. And, you know, I think we probably have the best clients in the world because they let me do whatever the hell I want to do when I want to do it. And they don't give me a hard time about it because they understand, you know, <clears throat> if you look at our track record, you know, we don't have anything really to do apologize for. So I wait till value comes to me. And you know what? I, I, I agree with Louie. I don't think that the Fed's going to raise. I think they're going to jawbone like crazy. But I think that's all they've got going. I don't think they can. And I think they, you know, so you're going to have periods where you get rates spike. And then if you've got some extra cash that you can't put to work, you know, you might go buy the 10 year T ETF and, you know, make some money. Um, it's, you know, that's speculative. But you know, my, my mentor, one of my mentors and my predecessor, Geraldine Weiss, you know, she was very folksy in her wisdom. And she used to say that, you know, stocks are like streetcars. Another one will come along pretty soon. And, you know, those are the kind of value people that we are. You know, we know what we want. We know what we're willing to pay for it. If we can't get it, you know, I'll sit in cash and I don't give a rat's gazoo, you know, what cash levels I, I'm at you know, on a day to day basis, because eventually I know I'm going to get my portfolios to where I want them to be. So that's that. Well, as individual stock pickers, every company that we analyze, uh, we set uh, a downside price as well as an upside price. It's not a target, but it's where the company could reasonably be valued in five years down the road if it does reasonably well according to our expectations and sells at a reasonable P.E. So there's a whole lot of reasonableness that's baked into it, which of course doesn't always work in a market that's not reasonable. But we also set that downside price based on not, not if the company uh, completely falls apart, it falls off its trend, but what happens if we are in an extended bear market? What would the likely downside be based on the, the historical low P.E. ratio ranges, based on uh, earnings that may not be growing as quickly? So for every company, you make an assessment. If you are looking at a correction that's impending before you deploy capital in any, in any particular case, you, we, we you know, provide a framework that helps you determine if there's too much risk compared to the reward in any particular equity. Uh, and again, I, I agree. I think a diversified portfolio for most investors is somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 18 to 25 stocks. Uh, if you hold more than that, you're just really closet indexing. And to, if you're an individual stock picker and you're looking at on a company by company basis, you're not going to buy, uh, you know, 15 stocks in a week. You're going to take some time, do the research, understand the business, look at the competitors, uh, supplement the uh, p advice that you pick up here with your own due diligence and your own research. Uh, so for us, the answer is uh, you're going to deploy cash when you find no better alternatives for it, uh, whatever the climate might be that you foresee coming down the pike. Yes, sir.
So the question, if I can summarize, is about a subsector of the energy industry, green energy, and whether it could survive on its own without government subsidy. Um, and the big oil guys. Yeah, the, well, oil has the highest inventory in 80 years. Uh, oil seasonal goes up in the spring, peaks in July, goes down in the fall. We'll know where the peak in oil is in July right after, after summer driving season will go down in the fall. Uh, but we have the highest inventory in, in 80 years, and um, Iraq and Saudi are producing record amounts to try and lock up all the Asian contracts. Uh, so oil's, and in fact, OPEC came out with a preliminary report uh, this week that uh, oil will never be at $100 a barrel ever, ever again. So that's, uh, they're, they're, they're accepting reality. And by the way, OPEC doesn't get along with each other. So that's the other thing. Um, you know, uh, yeah, you need the subsidies for all the green stuff. Um, you know, uh, I our firm is in northern Nevada, north of here. We got the Tesla plant. Uh, Tesla was uh, pretty smart to uh, to get a lot of stuff from the state of Nevada, including uh, uh, raising our electric bill. They're going to sell solar at a premium rate. Um, I think I should tell you the truth, though. Um, uh, and I have hybrid cars and all this stuff, and um, the um, a lot of this is all PR. You probably know the, and I own Apple, you probably know their new headquarters in Cupertino is incredible. It's like a flying saucer. It can take off and leave the planet anytime. any time, at least it looks like that. <laughs> it's all going to be powered by a vast uh, solar field. Okay, we have the Apple file server in northern Nevada, not too far from my office, in the cloud. The cloud is coal-fired. Now, maybe they like pizza, but uh, I find it ironically that when in the Bay Area, oh, we're extra green and blah, 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 and then you get up to where I am, I says, no, it's coal fired. So we have these debates, and I got a kid at Stanford, and we have all these debates and, uh, with all his friends, and I says, you know, I tell all the kids they're destroying the planet because every time they take a picture and have a selfie or a video, it gets stored in the cloud with a coal fired power plant. So I said, it's not cars, it's you. You're, it's you, and, and kids are broadband pigs, and uh, uh, so, but, uh, you know, the media is not objective, and Apple plays both sides, and, you know, I find it quite ironic, and then we got into the government. Where's, where's the government file service? Utah, you know, and, and guess what Utah is? It's coal-fired as well, so... Uh, you know, so all that spying we're doing is on everybody and storing all our records is all fired by coal fire power plants. So, um, so, uh, so maybe the spine's warming the planet, maybe it's the kids. And uh, uh, in the meantime, no one's going to tell you the truth. Uh, a lot of the answer to your question is economically driven. You know, it is not that these large energy companies do not have their own divisions or are not interested in green energy. At the same time, it is not profitable in many cases. You know, at the, you know, and yet what happens, you know, very transitionally over a long period of time is technology advances. You know, cars like the Tesla wouldn't even be possible with the battery technology of... 10, 12 years ago. And, and what happens is that the industry has to gradually catch up with the technological advances. And, and you know, it's our hope, and, and I think the hope of everyone on this, uh, at least aware of it on this planet, that the green energy stays alive, whether it has to be through subsidies or whether it has to be through encouragement of those large resource companies that, that are making their profits on coal fired or, 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 you know, the oil. But at the same time, over time, we will see that transition, whether it'll be fast enough be to prevent or slow down global warming. I don't know. We're seeing the glaciers in Montana all disappear at, at an increasing rate. And it's, it's very shocking to us up there. I mean, we are very, very aware of it in terms of the global warming, in terms of the loss of the glaciers in Glacier National Park. It's a loss of, of a resource. And, and I, I w there is no answer for your question today other than 
we all have to keep the pressure where hopefully it'll keep things moving in that direction and get those technological advances so that the cost comes down on those green sort resources or the, the green energy producers to make them more viable in terms of, of competitiveness with, with really what is profitable, economically speaking. Uh, all I would say on that is the world runs on energy and right now I don't know of an alternative to fossil fuel that's economically viable. When someone comes up with coal fusion then we'll have a ball game. Um, I think that capitalism is a marvelous economic system and when the market appears the answer for the market will appear. I think it's that simple. Uh, on, uh, this is not related, but uh, it's a question that I have to ask. Uh, we see all these medical marijuana cannabis stocks here at the show. Uh, with such a wide open space and so much opportunity, how come Philip Morris and Anheuser-Busch and big companies that have a lot of experience with controlled substances aren't uh, jumping all over this emerging uh, green industry? See, it's a green question, but just a different type. <laughs> Is it because it's not profitable yet, right? Or are, are there other factors at play here? This will have to be our last question, by the they're way. So. They're, actually, they're actually in the business through e-cigarettes. E-cigarettes, uh, you can get a synthetic cannabis that doesn't show up in your drug test, especially when you work in one of the casinos. So uh, I have a friend who's a grower down here who just quit growing to do the, um, the synthetic cannabis for all the e-cigarettes for all the local customers here. So, yeah, if your dealer's a little stoned, you know what happened. <laughs> but you might win. Well, with that, that wonderful note, please join with me in thanking our great panel.